inspiring to hear that, you know, just in that situation, you managed to pull it all round from from a really bad situation into being, I mean, your life's pretty much back on track now, isn't it? Um, and, and you're doing well for yourself. Um, I always think, I always take inspiration from anyone who's been in like an incredibly difficult situation mm-hmm. like yours mm-hmm. and has managed to just get through it Mm-hmm. to just get past it and to just survive it yeah so I think it's incredibly inspirational um, so um, was it was it quite a quick turnaround would you say then um, or would it would you say that you came to that decision about you know um, living as best as you could um, and and that sort of change in your mind about how you view the world and how you value the world was it quite quick or was it progressively it was progressive because my first year I was pining for my old lifestyle back oh, really so I feel that I did the right amount of time for me like you mentioned earlier yeah um, I had to have that party animal you know crushed out of me basically really by the judicial system and then this journey of self discovery self-education was was what built this foundation for me to put establish my present you know what i'm doing now on yeah yeah wow i mean i think my my turnaround it felt like it was very quick there was a period of me like coming to terms with what had happened basically yeah. um because it takes a bit of time there's a shock to your system isn't it when you yeah. first oh, you go through shock yeah Different and it's levels. just like what's happening mm-hmm. Some, sometimes it was every day you'd wake up and go what the hell is going on or you'd, yeah. you'd wake up and you know when you're still asleep eyes closed you'd think you were somewhere else yeah yeah. you open your eyes and you realise yeah. you're in prison you know? yeah well, well, here, we go. here we go again yeah yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah there was a period for me certainly where I was just adjusting and trying to think right is this my life now you know mm-hmm. what's happening and what can I make of this mm-hmm. if anything at all yeah and then, uh, yeah, it was probably a few weeks where I suddenly just got this positive feeling that like, no, I can, I can survive this mm-hmm. and maybe I'll be better for, at the end of it or I can try and be better. Mm-hmm. And ultimately, that's, I think that's all that anyone can really do in life is you make a decision, you deal with the consequences of it. Yeah. And then if you can try to aim to improve yourself and overcome any problems that cause mm-hmm. that initial mistake, then... I don't know what anyone else would want. Yeah. Um, I still feel like quite guilty because, because it was friends of mine and stuff mm-hmm. for, for my particular offence. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, I, I keep thinking, well, if they could see me now, I, I hope they'd at least be appreciative of the fact that I'm trying to be a better person. That's the thing, you can't change your past. Yeah. The most you can do is take responsibility for your crimes, acknowledge that you've done wrong, learn from the mistake, and then karmically just do the best you can in the future to balance out the harm that you've done in the past. Yeah, yeah. So that's what I learned. I mean, so over that over that like six year period, um, when you were re- doing a lot of reading, a lot of yeah, um, self discovery kind of stuff. Yeah. Were there any bumps along the road? Oh um, God, yeah. <laughs> I had a cellmate in. Actually, it was only medium security. I'd just come out of Supermax. I was hoping they were going to be a bit, a bit softer. And he was breaking into people's houses and taking hammers to their kneecaps. He was a serial home invader, torturer. Oh, wow. And he didn't get along with me at all. He saw me as a fresh fish. He was a hardcore con. And he just said to me right away, his welcoming statement was, I've got this padlock in a sock here. I can smash your brains in while you sleep. I can kill you whenever I want. <laughs> and I'm like... You know, I'm the, I'm the best cellmate you can ever have. I'm just a quiet guy. All I do is read and write. But he just, he just was, you know, didn't like me right, right off. Yeah, sometimes they're all about that dominance thing, aren't they? The people, yeah. People like to scare other people sometimes. Yeah. And know that they're quivering in the corner or something. And he got his mate then, a 20-stone California biker, to beat me up just as I was going to a visit with my parents who'd flown 5,000 miles to come and see me for Christmas. Oh, my God. That's yeah. awful. And the gang rule is you've got to hit back. If you don't hit back, everyone's going to punk you out. Yeah. I tried hitting back and it was like hitting a big bag of cement. <laughs> <laughs> and he was trained in kickboxing. Fuck. It didn't end up very well for me. <laughs> I mean, 20 stone, was, was he a tall guy as well? Yeah, he was big, handled like a big moustache, just like all tatted out, just Fucking like... hell. That's, oh, that's the yeah. vision of the yeah. prison... Piece of work. ...thug that you don't want to get involved with. Yeah, so... 
Were you okay though? What, like how you? Well, how bad they did I didn't get any teeth knocked out. Bones broken. He smashed my rib. Uh, not my ribs. My kidneys up. I was hurting for about a week, but I considered myself lucky compared to what I saw. What was going on in there? You know, people's getting eyeballs shanked, but eyeballs pulled out and stuff like that. Yes. Um, so in the end, it escalated with my cellmate. He's getting higher on heroin and meth shooting up constantly he was leaving needles out on purpose I actually stood on one of his needles trying to give me hepatitis C fortunately it only went, it only went in my foot a little bit it didn't get to the blood it was just stuck in my foot and okay just it out. skin kind of thing yeah but it got to the point where I got so scared with him I had to call my family and ask them to call the British Embassy and see if they'd get me moved because I thought he was going to kill me during my sleep he was keeping me awake all night interrogating me showing me the padlock and you know I, I said look when they call the prison they can't say anything I've said that would get him in trouble that would make me snitch. And then it's KOS kill on site. All the prisoners want to kill me. Mm. So the embassy handled it appropriately and I was moved without getting in trouble. He was throwing batteries at me for a couple of weeks afterwards until I got out of the cell. It was bigger, I had some words and then it stopped. <laughs> so that, you know, um, the, the point where I was at my suicidal low, living with the cockroaches, that was one of the worst points. And, and that's the, the serial home invader torture cellmate. That was in a, one of the worst points as well. How, how long into your sentence was that guy as well? That After was that was about um, two and a half years. So to, it's it must have been pretty hard to get through at least a fair portion of your sentence and then be facing that kind of difficulty. Again. Yeah, because I just come from the remand jail into the prison. I was in Supermax, and then I went over to uh, uh, like medium security where the prisoners come out of the cells. It was a big deal for me to be going in there. Mm. And uh, having him, you know, right off the cuff when I was just looking to reintegrate with these guys was, yeah. I, guess, I can't believe you got away from that, all right? It was relatively a, unscathed. It was a hefty challenge, but you know what? I credit it now because I've opened one of my books, Prison Time, with him. His sentence, I've got a padlock in a sock. <laughs> I'm going to smash your head in while you sleep. I'm going to go once. It's classic conflict, isn't it? So I, I, I'm thanking him now for giving me some good material for my book. <laughs> At the very minimum. If I would have got through it easy, I would have had nothing to write about. <laughs> <laughs> it's an incredible view of the situation, at least. <laughs> very yeah. positive view on it. Got to, haven't you? Got to be yeah. positive. Uh, so, um, then, uh, did you go down in terms of the security level? Of yeah, the I worked my way down to uh, minimum security. Yeah, and was that better? Or? Minimum. Doors click open at six in the morning, other than head counts. You've got to be, you can come out onto like a wreck area out in the desert. It's hot and stuff, you know, but baseball cap and shades, it was fine. Guys are working out on pull ups and dip bars and stuff like that. There's some phones where you can call, reverse charge, call your local family and stuff like that. And um, yeah, you know, in the end, I formed alliances with people who protected me. And mm. the main guy was two Tonys working on his life story right now, he dictated it to me in prison. He, he was doing 112 years. He was a mafia mass murderer, only murdered gangsters, so he said it was a crime of integrity. And um, he was at the top of the respect in the prison, because if you, if you have only murdered gangsters, that puts you at the top where I was at. Anyone who's murdered a woman or a child, or has any crime to do with a woman or a child, it's kill on sight. The, the prison's bottom. trying to kill those guys when they come in. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it wasn't killing in UK prisons, but in the terms of the hierarchy of respect and disrespect, almost exactly the same. Yeah, it's convict justice in the criminal code, isn't yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So once he took me under his wing, if I got beat up, I would have got moved and I wouldn't have been able to continue his, his life story, which was a several month project. Oh, so he was protecting you for that reason? Well, one of the reasons, but by the end of it, he said I was like the son that he'd never had. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. yeah. A nice sentiment. Yeah, but sadly he died from his own drug taking as well, from liver cancer, a couple of years after he got released. Oh, yeah, that's quite sad. Did you finish his uh, story? Yeah, he dictated it to me, and I'm just presently just finishing it up right now. And um, his spirit lives on in me in the sense that he taught me to appreciate the value of small things. One of his favourite books was A Day in the Life of Ivan Donosovich by Alexander Solzhenitsyn, hmm. where Ivan's in the Russian gulag, they're getting worked to death, so cold if you spit you spit freezes mid-air and anytime the prisoners complained about anything where we were at two times would laugh at them and say look the, the, the prisoners are complaining because the breakfast is cold in the morning how can they complain when where Ivan was at they were fighting over a fish eyeball in the soup <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> wow, that is a man who can appreciate anything. Wow. Yeah, and and, then, and now by appreciating the small things, I don't go looking for trouble in all the wrong places. You know, there's no dead rats in my food. There's no cockroaches in my bed. We've we've got things so good in the West compared to a lot of the horrible stuff that's going around in the world. You know? Yeah, definitely. In these war torn countries. Yeah. Um, you just gotta appreciate what we've got while we're here. And uh, I, I, I mean. I'm kind of the same mind as what was he called? Two Tonys. Two Tonys. Two Tonys. Yeah. What a strange name. Yeah. Why, why was he called that? Two Tonys got that name because there was two um, guys whacked out of LA called Tony, and the whackers, the guys, got in the back of a vehicle, and they shot the two Tonys who were in the front. One of the whackers was called Charles Bats Battaglia. He was a mafia lieutenant for the Bonanno crime family, which was the most powerful Italian mafia family. And that was Two Tony's boss at one point in time. Right. But over the years, Two Tony's started to whack people and rose up above this guy. And this guy threatened Two Tony's in a restaurant one morning. And Two Tony's turned the tables on him, threatened him back, and he backed down. And when they left the restaurant, Two Tony's crime partner, Sal Spinelli, said to him, when you threatened him and he backed down, I could see the spirit of the two Tonys above his head. <laughs> <laughs> that's brilliant. So it's like the two Tonys were embodied in him. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's genius. Yeah. I like that for the reason that's what he was called. I kind of agree with him on the uh, the little things, appreciating little things. Because yeah. one of the one of the mantras that I learned when I was inside was um, try to think of three things that you appreciate every day. Yeah. And it was something that really pulled me out of like a mental slump where even if you appreciate just someone saying hello in the morning, yeah. you think, oh, that's nice. They didn't need to mm. say that. That was nice of them. And I got some warm food today. That's nice. Yeah. And, you know, you get to have a visit or anything like that. And I just started appreciating three things a day. Just every time before I went to sleep, I'd think over the day and go, oh, that was nice. That was nice. And that brings your mind into the present. You focus on something positive and you're not worrying about what might happen in the future or hooked into the past, which is what most of us... A lot of us spend our time doing it. Exactly, yeah. yeah. You obsess about the mistakes that you've made in the past and, yeah. and about past glories that you've had that you can't get anymore. Yeah. Rather than focus on the present and the future. Yeah. So, did you meet any other characters when you're inside that's similar to oh, Two Tonys? Endless cast of characters in prison. <laughs> Ranging from my friend Xena, giant transsexual. Um, <laughs> now, the transsexuals in prison. Zena, for example, believes he is a woman trapped in a man's body. Mm. So to try and become the woman that he believes he is, then he had estrogen smuggled in, but they got to a point where he then woke up one morning, drinks coffee, grabs a razor blade, and tries to cut his man parts off. <laughs> the testicles are on some branches, and he slashed open the scrotum, <laughs> cut one of them off, He's got his hand in the scrotal sack looking for the other one. It retracts into his body and he can't find it. It's hiding out inside him. He's got his hand in his guts looking for it. He was bleeding to death. Oh my God. And they got a helicopter just in time to, to get him to hospital to save his life because he was, he was bleeding. Wow. So much. Wow. And uh, they put him on suicide watch when he got back, but a couple of years later, he got the other one off as well. <laughs> They do that to stop the testosterone, get estrogen smuggled in, and then they feel like they're more at peace, oh, they're more f- feeling like they're more women. So, yeah. leaving the knob, but they just get rid of the testicles. I asked about the main part, and they said that it, it, it shrinks and retracts. Wow, self surgery. Yeah, basically. DIY surgery. Wow, that is insane. Yeah. yeah. Gotta have some level of pain threshold there to be able to do that yeah yeah the pain um Zena's described the pain to me and it's like oh, out of this world um, oh, goes through th- th- was a, a female i met a, a, a transsexual i met um she got both of hers off and she almost looked like a woman yeah really Close, closest thing she was in high demand sexually Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, God, yeah. Was, was there a, what kind of percentage would you say of American prisoners are transgender? Well, a very small percent are transgender, but right. most prisoners were receiving oral sex from transgender prisoners. Oh, right, I see. And so. it was actually considered straight to receive oral sex from a prisoner. <laughs> and I was told after five years I'd be doing it. 
I had a woman visiting me and I didn't go there. <laughs> <laughs> you opted out of that. <laughs> I mean, the, the, I understand the pressure, the sexual yeah. pressure. You know, you go years of having no female proper contact. Yeah, you'll take anything. Well, there's various stages that the prisoners go through. They uh, There's a thing called a Fifi bag. I don't know if you guys had the equivalent of the UK system. I can guess what it is. It's like a, a washcloth soaked up with lube on it. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, after so many years, you switch from your right hand to your left hand because it's like a whole new experience. Uh. <laughs> the stranger, as they call it. The stranger! <laughs> Sit something around the fire. It goes dead, and then it just feels like someone else. <laughs> <laughs> I always was quite impressed when I was inside and the ingenuity levels of prisoners yeah. for creating new kind of sex toys and things it was yeah. almost like a field of engineering where they you know they go no no you need this kind of shampoo and you mix it with this kind of thing yeah. you put it in the rubber glove surround all that with this and then cut a hole in your mattress or something you know it's cra- it was crazy but I was slightly impressed at the deviance yeah the ingenuity there's a lot of intelligent people in prison and they you know <laughs> Zena had a beaded g-string that Zena had made for herself. <laughs> Zena uh, and her boyfriend were making sex toys, melting things down and making sex toys. <laughs> <laughs> it's so mad. I mean, I only did, I did like just over 14 months inside, but I can understand, understand that level of sexual frustration where, yeah. I mean, I was pretty sexually frustrated, but in part, I think that's because you're surrounded by men. Yeah. Very, there was very few women there was like maybe a couple female screws around here and there yeah. in the prisons that I was in and then a few in education and stuff as well but because they weren't around you all the time you're just living with loads of other blokes yeah I just, think, just to clarify for my U- US listeners screw means guard in the UK not, <laughs> not having sex yeah so he's screw <laughs> a prison officer yeah um, and uh, yeah even after my short stint in time I was like a sexual tyrannosaurus <laughs> anything that would come near me I was like, ah. at least that's what I felt like you know when I went out um, but well, there's all kinds of stuff going on it just the, the receiving of the oral sex was just the beginning of uh, understanding of what was going on to me really? there was prostitution um, wow there was guys who had wives and girlfriends visiting them but they were secretly gay and to the, to the visitors and that's called gay for the stay and when they get released they go back to the wives and girlfriends there was guys in open, open um, gay relationships. There were punks who were like slaves, who were just prostitutes, who were just traded to other people. P- punks? What punks. A like? punk is someone you own that is your bitch. It's your prison bitch, basically. Oh, I see. Yeah, and, and you know, they will do all your cleaning, your cell, scrub your toilet, do your laundry, uh, make your bed and perform sexual services for you and then you can rent that person out as well to other, other prisoners. Damn, so you didn't want to be a punk effectively. That's the one no, thing you didn't once want to you, It's called being turned out. Once you're turned out, turned into a punk, everyone is going to have a go at you. Then. Is that it's like just, if, if, you, if you... It's like when you submit effectively. Yeah. Like when you get to that yeah. stage of, yeah. of submission. I was yeah. ready to fight to the death if yeah. anything happened. <laughs> I got threatened a few times and I was thinking, you know, I'm going to fight and... If worst was the worst, I was just gonna crap all over myself and then just smear it on the faces and in their eye in their eyeballs and everything just to stop it. You've literally I mean, you've seen the Shawshank Redemption. He gets nailed, doesn't he, several times by the oh, sisters. Yeah, yeah you've got to I was determined not to let that happen, you know. Yeah. I would fight to the death just to protect my anal virginity. <laughs> <Absolutely>. <laughs> See, I was I was like worried about that when I went inside. And I think after maybe six months or something of being in, I, I was like, it doesn't... It, I heard rumours of it yeah. here and there, but mm. it was all kept very, very yeah. under wraps. Um, so anything that I did here, it was like hard to confirm anything. But the, And there was a few guys who were like prolific for that kind of stuff. But yeah. uh, as long as I avoided those kind of people, I yeah. seemed to be okay. So I thought, oh, maybe it won't be a problem. Um, and luckily for me, it wasn't. Did anyone try and coerce you? Because what I noticed was there was probably more coercion, especially of young people. Like people will get people in debt and then say, you pay this debt yeah. back by doing this. Yeah, yeah. People tried to do that a lot. Yeah. About, like, well, I'll just lend you, you know, two, yeah. two lots of tobacco or something. Or, yeah. I'll just, yeah, I have the shirt. It's fine. You know, you can just owe me. Yeah. And I was just like, no, I'm fine. Yeah. I, I thought when I first went in, I just went in and 
the clothes I was on because mm-hmm. I got hit by that car though right. all my jeans were ripped and everything all dirty and all torn and stuff yeah so I just thought, oh, fuck it. I can just survive in mm. any... As long as I can just mm. eat and sleep yeah. just a little bit, I'm just going to try and survive on the bare minimum. I just didn't care. Yeah. So I, I'll just stink the entire time. I don't mm. give a fuck. Mm-hmm. But then after a while, I learned that that was kind of a thing that you yeah. had to do. Like, you couldn't smell because then the person you were with in a pad would beat the shit out of you. Yeah, hygiene is, is one of the gang rules. Yeah. Um, but, but prison rape was so prevalent where I was at, they had what's called a rape class. Whereby you had to go and watch videos with the guards about what to do if someone's raped yeah. and how to avoid it, not take sweets off predators and all this stuff. And then if someone is raped, you got to report it to the guards. And then they, we said to the guards, look, if you report anything, you snitch. Yeah. To kill on site for snitches. Yeah. And right after the rape class I attended, a mentally ill prisoner was then gang raped and no one reported a thing. Yeah, so yeah. You, you could have gone and told them effectively that that class does nothing. Does it nothing. Just, it, it maybe educates people a little bit, but it doesn't help in the real situation. No, all, the, all the classes they were doing were just token. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's just so they can tick all the boxes to say that they've done that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And there's a contract behind it, someone's making some money off it somewhere. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. yeah. So were you aware of anyone who got raped in your buildings? There, uh, there was one guy who had a... A few, he was a friend um, and he'd got in a fight mm. of some kind yeah there was as far as I knew he didn't tell me any of this I just I went and mm. researched it and tried and investigate myself yeah and he was in some debt with some problems so some guy had been beaten on him a few times to get this money back yeah and then there was he was a really like lively guy mm. and then for a month period he, he said almost nothing at all to anyone yeah um, so I was suspicious of that yeah uh, but I couldn't ever I couldn't find out like narrow it down to anything less than a dozen people yeah like who it might be associated with but i had suspicions but no and I, I never really mm-hmm. i never got confirmation of anything um i kind of think that must have been what happened because he didn't get beaten up that much yeah he got beaten a little bit uh, he had like a black eye um but it seemed more like it was psychological than yeah. anything else so because other than that nothing though really because zena got gang raped when he came in and he was big he was he was weightlifting and he was debt collecting for the Aryan brotherhood and they turned against him and they gang raped him multiple times, shoved a broomstick in his behind, gang raped him while he was unconscious. And I said to him, well, how do you know if they were raping you if, if you were unconscious? And his response was, when I went to the toilet afterwards, I could tell by what came out. Uh. And the way he ended up stopping it was he was studying anatomy and he basically said to the gang, I don't care if I'll ever die anymore. And the next two times they attacked him, the first member to grab him he plucked her eyeball out so it was dangling from the optic nerve. Like hanging out here? Hanging out there. And it does not go back in and it's never normal again. I mean, it, I'm sorry, it, go, it does go back in but, but it's, it's never, never normal, normal again. again. I see, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It messes your vision up. It messes your eyeball up. For so you said... Yeah, and I, I didn't believe there was you could possibly do that. But, but now I do, I do karate now. It's, it's called a chicken beat strike where you just... Like that. And it kind of makes sense. I can imagine pops, that, Pops yeah. the eye out very, very rapidly. Ah... He also um, had a friend who was gang raped and they took a light bulb, shoved it in his backside and smashed it while it was in there. Mm. And another one who was gang raped and decapitated. Fuck. They took a, a shovel from the work crew, held him down and cut his head off with it. And then they positioned the head in an area of the prison where the rival gangs would see to make the point they were the baddest gang. Wow, that yeah. is ridiculous. Yeah. It's crazy, like, just some of them other points you were making. Uh, I often think like how how did people survive that like how yeah. have they lived through that because it's like yeah. such it's so on the edge of being like a fatal injury I mean they're all potentially fatal injuries yeah obviously decapitation yeah but uh, it, I'm just like I'm so shocked that like people can go through that and live past it you know well when you look in Zena's face you can just see in Zena's eyes the horrific things that, that Zena's experienced yeah, yeah it's just written all over her face wow some things you yeah. can't unlive or forget I, yeah. I guess but yeah so you've been through quite a lot of different um, situations and prisons mm-hmm. um, and you write about it a little bit now that's kind of how uh, we met um, mm-hmm. so tell us a little bit about what you're up to now what, what you never, never set out to be a writer in the, guard, in the jail where the guards were routinely murdering the prisoners, including mentally ill prisoners, I said to a guard, how does the jail get away with all this, the human rights violations? Mm. And the guard said to me, the world has got no idea what's going on in here. 
So, re- reflecting on the harm I've done putting people on the road with drug use, believing karma, couldn't change my past, so I, I resolved to go out and share my story with people. Yeah. And now I'm, I'm probably going to do about 150 talks at schools across the country um, this yes. academic year. It's probably spoke to 100,000 students over a five year period, and I get all this feedback from the students, especially on Twitter. Yeah. If you go on my Twitter feed, Sean Atwood, and look at the favourites, it's just all live feedback coming in from the students. Oh, that's good. And they don't listen to the parents and the teachers, but because I've been through it, you know, and they say, look, we thought drugs was cool, but now we can see what it, that, that leads to. Mm. Even get parents requesting to meet me, say stuff like, look, if we can get a grunt off our kid when he got out of school, but wouldn't show up about your talk, and it was the first time we could sit down and talk to him about drugs. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. so, you know, it's, it's, it's balancing out what I did hopefully and trying to do, trying to influence these young people. Yeah. Well you're yeah. doing something positive. It's a standalone yeah. event, you're doing something positive. Yeah. yeah. And and I mean it's a testament to it being positive if you're getting loads of positive feedback and you're still doing uh, the talks. That's what keeps me motivated to do it. If they didn't react, if there wasn't any feedback, I'd, I'd just stop doing it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Very attention seeking. You need to have constant <laughs> <laughs> to feel that I'm doing good. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for talking to me. Sean. Cheers, yeah, it's, thanks it's for your time. Yeah, appreciate it. Keep doing what you're doing as well, man. Cheers, thank you. Subscribe to our channels. <laughs> <laughs>